welcome to the session. Um, my name is Nick Ashton Hart. I'm uh, the Geneva representative of the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, the, the internet, I think, as everyone knows, has become uh, uh, central to, to trade uh, of all kinds. Um, when people think of the internet and, and, and trade, they tend to think of big uh, commerce sites or search engines, but really there's um, compelling evidence that three quarters of the benefits of the internet actually accumulate in, in to traditional industries um, on a pretty uh, even-handed basis. Um, but the internet itself has created markets which are highly transparent and, and efficient and create um, low barriers to entry uh, to what is effectively a global online market. But little attention is actually so far in, in, in economic literature being focused on how transformative that impact is for SMEs, even though small and medium-sized enterprises are upwards of 90% of the economic activity in pretty much any country that you, you name. So this shift is obviously going to have uh, profound impacts on trade and development. And given that we know um, from the principle of network effect that the economic and, and other value represented by each internet user is actually increased with every new internet user who comes online, and we know that less, slightly less than half of all of the world's population is online, we can expect that the changes that we have seen so far are really just the beginning of, of the impact that we will see. Um, an interesting number that I, I, I calculated for a report based on ITU statistics last week found that um, on year to year, um, the number of new internet users who go online for the first time every day was about half a million last year. It's about 678,000 this year. To give you an idea, uh, I mean, I, I use this because it works at home, but um, that's the population of Geneva in six hours, uh, the population of Switzerland in six days, and about 250 million people in a year. And it's accelerating. So this is a pretty topical panel <clears throat> to talk about how 90% of economic activity can be transformed um, using the internet as a, as a way of meeting markets. For that, we, we um, have Farid Marouf of the Grameen Foundation in Jakarta on my left, uh, and Usman Ahmed of eBay from the US on my right, and um, hopefully, he says, uh, Anne Maru, the director of the Technology and Logistics Division of, of UNCTAD, who is meant to be on my right or left, and will hopefully appear at some point during this. So um, I, I guess the, the, the host country's privilege is to go first. Um, so uh, so we, should, we should hear from, from Farid about Grameen's work. And of course, you'll see there's a presentation behind us. Well, there's a security alert behind us. OK, now there's a presentation. Farid. OK, thanks. Thanks for that. I got first-class helper here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Farid Maruf. Um, I work for Grameen Foundation. For some of you maybe um, not yet familiar with what Grameen Foundation is. Uh, Grameen Foundation is an organization that is inspired by the work of Professor Yunus. Uh, we basically a poverty-oriented um, poverty uh, organization. We are a nonprofit NGO in Indonesia. We work on that area, technology uh, in the microfinance, what we s Professor Yunus started, uh, technology. Um, currently, we focus more on building social enterprise, small enterprises, small social impact businesses. Um, yeah. <coughs> uh, next, thanks. When we do our work in Indonesia, we actually, uh, or when our work in other part also in the world. We have uh, four main pillars in when we work with the poor, which is uh, the poor is have 
problem of insufficient income, in insufficient and inconsistent income. Um, they don't have the ability to tolerate shocks and manage risks. And then lack of essential and action, actionable information. And the uh, last part is that um, they need um, sometimes not really understood by the people. So by anybody's, the company, the corporations, you know. Um, so uh, sometimes the service were designed for them by people who actually not really close to them. Uh, <coughs> so uh, next, thank you. Uh, the way we uh, work, we have three solution area covering all those uh, uh, four pillars. We have information services. Uh, then we have financial services. We have poverty tool insights. Uh, this is where uh, we're trying to help organization to focus more on helping the, the poor. Uh, information services. Uh, this is where I guess I get invited because this is where the internet uh, play a part. Uh, we built several solutions um, over the years uh, regarding health, uh, agriculture, uh, especially in, in um, Africa. When we talk about small and medium enterprises, actually we are, our focus is small and micro enterprises, uh, what we call also micro um, entrepreneurs, where the business only have one or two people working with them, or sometimes they, this is a family. Uh, we provide information services for, for these businesses so they can have, get additional income. On financial services, we provide uh, knowledge, products for them, financial services, like microloans, uh, um, MFS, mobile and financial services, like mobile money. Um, this is, la later I will tell the story why mobile money become exciting in, in, the, in, the, in the development world. Um, and then also uh, financial inclusion products, insurance, banks, saving, and so forth. Uh, the last one is poverty tools and insight, where we create a tool, we put on the cloud, the internet, where organization could focus their uh, work to help the poor and measure not only targeting the right poor people, but also measure the, the impact. We create a tool called Progress Out of Poverty Index based on census of uh, each country, and then we, from there we ask 10 most relevant questions to, to put you in where actually in the poverty score cut between one to 100, where are you? So if the company or organization want to target this uh, uh, group of people, then they can use this and, and design the correct product for it. Next. In Indonesia, poverty, uh, this is the data that we I just got this morning from World Bank. 60%, uh, almost 147 million live under $2.50 PPP. 64% uh, of them living in rural area. Um, then if you look at it, Eastern Indonesia is the most uh, highest poverty incidence. Uh, interesting about this is that in internet, only 20 million uh, users, but we have 249 mobile uh, cellular numbers. We have 250 million people in Indonesia, but we have 245 unique mobile numbers. I mean, even a baby have them. But actually, because we, we like to have more, uh, m some people, multiple uh, numbers, I myself have two, some people have three, I guess. Uh, the fact is uh, that mobile penetration is 85% in Indonesia. So if you look at this, there's a 60% people poor, and then there's a 85% mobile users. There's potential for subset of poor people have this mobile phone, which is actually this is what we've we seen for the last few years. We see more and more uh, smartphone uh, uh, in the, the base of pyramid uh, audience. Next. <coughs> so, a um, little bit historical uh, focus in Indonesia, what we do. Uh, in financial services in Indonesia, we 
providing microfinance uh, uh, help of running the Grameen model uh, microfinance. We have progress on property. We help with the, uh, some uh, uh, companies. I guess at this moment, total of people who are using, um, reach out by progress of property around 2 million people. And then uh, the last one, in impact investing. This is where we look for a company, small, medium enterprises, uh, social enterprises. We help them come up with idea. We will provide them a funding between 250,000 to 500,000. This is a lot of money where after they run out their own money, their family money, their dad money, their uncle money, then before they go to their uh, first round of investment, this is where the sweet spot uh, between winning business competition and the first uh, round of uh, fundraising. So uh, we have several uh, success on this area. Uh, next. Uh, the interesting success that, we, that I want to tell the story here is the company that we incubate. Grameen Foundation is a non-profit organization. We're not supposed to do a business here. We should not receive income in Indonesia. Therefore, we're looking a company, or we incubate a company, small medium company. Uh, it's called Ruma, social enterprise. Maybe you don't, uh, you're already familiar with the, 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 uh, the terminology of social enterprise, meaning they have double bottom line. They have double bottom line, meaning they have profit bottom line, and they have social bottom line. Um, that mean the, if the dividend will not uh, distribute it if they don't meet their social impact. Then they have the social impact to define. So um, Ruma, the company that incubate, is a small medium company that built a network of uh, micro entrepreneur. Micro entrepreneur is the, the in Indonesia we call uh, warung, uh, small shops where they're selling daily necessities. Uh, we're trying to equip them with additional portfolio product, which is selling airtime uh, digital product. This is inspired when uh, Professor Yunus, when they st when he start in Bangladesh, he give it a loan, and then the loan will be used to buy a phone, and the phone then uh, rented to the neighbors. We're trying to replicate this in Indonesia. In the first three months, we find out we have uh, failed. Uh, reason is simple, because everybody have phone. Everybody have mobile phones. Nobody renting a phone anymore. I think some of Indonesian remember back then we have a wartel. No longer have wartel. You couldn't find any wartel. Some poor people have two or three phones, you know, because they have different uh, mobile uh, uh, telecom operator that offer them special package. If I call my friends, I use this telecom cell. If I call my family, I call using Excel, those kind of thing. So then we find out that one of the best way of uh, you know, to, to help them is to create ability for these small shops to sell airtime. It was started from airtime, but then we uh, equip them with additional product, the uh, digital product. So the, this project was funded by Qualcomm. Um, it's an American company that uh, in telecommunication. Then uh, it's from selling airtime, the room has become a very... Um, not, uh, very known for the the, comp the, inst the organization that have a building a network of people, network of uh, of uh, so, uh, small enterprises. Currently, they have a uh, 15,000 uh, small shops selling from airtime to m m uh, remittance, uh, uh, paying el uh, prepaid electricities, paying uh, installment of mo motorcycle, which is before some people have to travel all the way to the town to make big cities. Now they can do r all in the last mile, the remote area, to the next neighbor. This is also create stream of income for this small warung. And uh, this has been uh, uh, seeing new ways of improvement by uh, the Bank of Indonesia trying to push mobile money. Mobile money uh, is one of the best tools to fight poverty because it's the most efficient way to transfer small money from the big city to the villages and the villages to big cities. Uh, this is what stimulate economy in the villages, and at the same time, villages can send money efficiently to, to their son who study in, in this city. Next. How do we, Ruma, uh, help this? This is what we call 
micro franchise. Basically, franchise has four elements, mostly three elements, actually, regular franchise, but micro franchise have the fourth element, which is capital. The first one is idea. When you have, uh, when you have money, not necessarily you have a good business idea. What business do I want to do? So franchise helping you to have that business idea. Number two is knowledge and tool. I believe none of you will, uh, not, not all of you could be a successful restaurant, uh, you know, business restaurant, except, you know, if you're running McDonald's. Why? Because McDonald's is a franchise, so clear what to do. You know, you have thick of books, they have uh, trainings, all the things manual. Some of them, some of you may be expert in, sell, uh, I mean, have a luck in uh, opening restaurant, but for those who never have a business restaurant, maybe having a franchise, McDonald's, or, you know, Burger King, or ice cream, is easier. So McDonald's or other franchise provide you knowledge how to run business and tool. In our case, also the same, we create knowledge how to sell airtime business, how to sell remittance, how to sell mobile payment, to the, the, the villages. We create tool of them. We create server for them so they can connect, they can talk to switches to multiple payment uh, facilitators. The third one is risk alleviation. That means if you run a successful business, the risk has become less for you. I mean, um, if you start going to somewhere that you never, you know, been before, there's a risk for you to fail, especially you have, you have no, no knowledge of it. The last one is capital. Now, the capital, uh, it is back to MFI that we have. We give them one-day uh, one credit, uh, uh, supplier credit, so they can sell this product for one day. Next day, we collect them. So this is the capital that we help them. Next. So currently, uh, our macro entrepreneurs on the Ruma, um, yes? Oh, currently? No, no, no. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. You I thought. Are one, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, you are one of the micro entrepreneurs? <laughs> anyway, so that currently the Indonesian micro entrepreneur that we under Roma can do airtime sales, bill payment, prepaid electricity, uh, you know, remittance, market intelligence surveyor, mobile money agent, financial inclusion agent. Uh, market intelligence surveyor. This is where we create a tools, uh, survey tools, where all these ladies who are selling, uh, um, you know, daily necessity, this like this warung, uh, could become a surveyor. They can act as a, a, a enumerator to ask certain things about, for example, about environment, about uh, products. So they every survey that they they conduct, that they can get compensated, and this is easier for us to compensate. 10 cent, 1 cent, because we're using airtime to transfer that, that money to them, and then they can sell it again. So, I mean, this is how efficient. Otherwise, it, it's very difficult to, to, to distribute 10 cent to, to uh, physically 10 cent to people. Mobile money agent, this is where they can become uh, cash in, cash out for mobile money. People can come to them later on and collect a, uh, uh, you know, if they want to transfer, they can deposit, or if they want to cash in, they can uh, cash out, they can ask the money. Uh, this, is, this is a very good uh, model because problem for m many mobile money agents is that they managing the cash flow. I mean, there's a lot of people more cashing out rather than cashing in. Uh, so sometimes mobile money agent facing a problem, uh, you know, have no cash. But if they have business, then they ha they, they br the income from the, the, their business can become a uh, 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 cash flow uh, uh, source. Uh, financial inclusion agent. Uh, we're trying to work with some banks, so they become agent of collecting saving. So the people and uh, the poor doesn't have to travel so many kilometers if they want to do saving. They can go to these uh, ladies and then they deposit the money and then the lady will deposit it into the bank through their account and then the, the confirmation comes to phone. Next. Um, so this, this is what we've been done uh, so far. Uh, Applap is the thing that we developed during the RUMA the incubation. Now we're also entering the inclusive business tool we call Arrowworks, where we expand our coverage. Not only we and uh, focusing on the, the, the poor, but we also focusing on the organization who help the poor. And this project also get helped by um, eBay. 
uh, we get grant from eBay to create a marketplace. So part of the Tara Works will be marketplace for the village and the people to uh, promote their product, sell product and services based on location. Uh, currently, we are focused on agriculture product. Uh, next. Now, um, where do we, we go now? Um, we, since we said we are going to small, medium, enterprise, micro, below, so we want to cover these three, three areas based on the knowledge that we have uh, from other parts of the world, which is mobile financial services, poverty insights, and agriculture information. Ideally, uh, with the project that we just uh, completed, um, um, with help with the eBay team, uh, we want to create a marketplace where farmers could get additional income, not only from their farming, but also from other services, like providing a input supplier to the farmers surrounding them. Input is uh, seed, fertilizers, those kind of things. And uh, also, they can, uh, we have a project a program in, in uh, Uganda where farmer providing um, knowledge, farming practice. And for every farming practice that they delivered, they get compensated. Um, also, we have a project where farmers become a enumerators to collect data for certain organizations like FAO, World Food Programs, so farmers uh, could, could receive additional income. Next. Um, yeah, actually, this is the last one, but I want to, in the context of help helping SMEs, uh, there's another slide, actually, uh, backup slide. This is one of the projects that we completed here called Kerja Lokal. Kerja Lokal is a, a job market for low-skill, low-income uh, work, informal work. Now, the system is, is, uh, is smart enough to get this information of what kind of work that I'm interested in, and where is, my, where is my location, and match it with the supply of the job that is closest to my location. So if SME looking, for example, there's a SME working in uh, furniture, looking for carpenter, they will look for carpenter actually that look that look close, living closely, not from different island. So this job uh, market enable for both of them to be connected. Now, job market is just only a starting. But later on, you can also create uh, another channel where you can offer, for example, uh, other services, photography for wedding photography in the villages, or you know, um, tailors, uh, or uh, other things, you know, drivers, securities, those kind of things. And, and product as well, like uh, fertilizer, seed, even until, uh, like if the farmers want to consolidate their transport, I want to sell my crops to the villages and they can find who offer them a uh, 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 share, kind of transport sharing that closest to their location so they can save the, uh, the costs together. So this is something that we are working uh, with uh, uh, marketplace that we, we built currently uh, to expand that and um, uh, the other part of the, we we also looking to implement this in Philippines and also in some part of in um, Africa. So that's actually the, the way we as uh, Grameen work on the small and medium micro enterprises. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fareed. Um, well, we, we, we have enough time that uh, we could Take a couple questions for Fareed, if you like, before we uh, we turn to uh, eBay, if anyone has anything in mind. Otherwise, you can think of some. Microphone's coming. <laughs> or you could shout. But. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Don Hollander, and I have a micro little business in New Zealand selling secondhand books. Uh, and we use the internet for that. Um, one specific question, the Kerja local, is that permanent or just casual 
staff or both? Um, the idea is to help the people to find a job uh, that um, s small pay, small scale. So this is related sometimes permanent work, like factory workers, or temporary works. Or service. Yeah. Okay, so it would be both. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. More general question. The issue that I'm seeing throughout um, the developing world is who I want to sell books to. Well, I'm happy to sell books to the developed world as well. But is getting money from them to me. So in the developing world, there's a good banking system and there's a lot of trust and so they can pay by using their uh, credit cards or their credit cards through something like PayPal. But in the developing countries, there's no trust. So is your foundation doing anything to help facilitate that trust, either with a, you know, developing a MasterCard debit thing and, and having that distributed as part of your, your mobile money, that sort of stuff? Um, yeah, we not specifically build the trust, but we specifically building the, the product for using mobile money for these people. For example, um, uh, we know in one of the s successful story in mobile money is in Kenya. In Kenya, you can you you can pay taxi using mobile phone. You know, just transfer that, uh, but. As they said, you know what happened in Kenya not necessarily could happen in the other part of the world. So uh, the, there is no other success uh, stories about mobile money except probably Tanzania, but other countries trying to, to to replicate this. So it is related when it, when it comes to trust. It's related to the government's uh, 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 intervention, you know, to ensure that the organization that engage in that mobile money is not going to be embezzled, you know, just a, you know those kind of things. Uh, so Indonesia is very careful about that, especially after we have this banking crisis in 1998. So we currently uh, work on both sides, uh, the, the people who work on the mobile money, working from the private sector side, which is helping the company like you to understand the, the benefit of mobile monies, you know, the micropayment, those kind of things. And also from the regulatory, which is working with uh, Bank of Indonesia, banking industry, telco industry, to make sure that, you know, there's a uh, healthy ecosystem. Our, our uh, part is not doing that. What we have the ability is that we can train the agent of networks. Agent of network, the people who get the cash in, cash out. Yeah. And... Uh, Finding the products. What kind of product actually matters for the poor? Um, one good example, um, I think, this is a little bit uh, off from your question, but to, to give you, uh, um, you know, why the product for the poor is important, is that in Uganda, we find that one of the products that interesting that people like is called me to me. That means you sending money to yourself. It doesn't make any sense, right? Why do I sending money to myself? But for the poor people, where they sometimes they don't have enough cash, if they have cash a little bit, their family start coming to them, asking for the money. The husband can start, you know, asking the money from from the mother. So they sending that money like two weeks in ahead to to ensure that when they need, for example, the, for the kids, the money will arrive. So this kind of thing only can be found if you work right on the poor and design the product from there. So this is something that when you start building the, the, the benefit, then I think the, the, the trust start building there. Well, and, and conveniently, PayPal is a part of eBay, and so Usman can, can speak about that some more. So uh, over to you, Usman, for your... Uh, you well, uh, yeah, oh, sure, certainly. You could certainly start with that. Just to quickly add to Parid's points. Um, the mobile, the branchless banking, mobile money uh, kind of trend is very, very new, and it's mostly uh, national in its scope, right? And the question that you were raising deals with international transactions. How do you establish trust with a consumer that's overseas? 
And so yes, PayPal is one of the examples, credit cards. Um, these are methodologies for doing that. And I think it's, it's just a, a matter of time before um, some of the branchless banking examples get linked yeah, into some of those larger intermediary networks. So as Fried mentioned before branchless mobile banking, these folks didn't have bank accounts at all. So it's a, it's a gradual process where first they're getting their bank account, they're using it for local purchasing, then they'll you know, get it, buy a computer and be able to log on to, to the network and be able to access products from all around the world. And then they'll say, okay, I need to link my bank account to one of these kind of intermediaries so that I can establish the trust with a, with a merchant that's in some other country. So I just think it's a, it's a gradual process and it's just really early on in the process um, from a, from a, particularly from the poor poverty standpoint for those folks. But on, on our side, uh, in the, in the medium developing countries, uh, you know, Brazil, India, China, we are seeing a, a very big uptake in cross-border transactions um, over the eBay network and over the PayPal network, um, where those intermediary platforms are serving to, to establish the trust um, with both between the merchant and the consumer, even though they live thousands of miles apart and have never met. Is there another question for Fareed? Or, of course, we will have time later also if you, if you like. Seeing none. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for setting this up, and everyone for, for coming in. I hope we can. Uh, I, I, I'm, I really think that this is a, a very nice segue from Fareed's presentation because. Uh, eBay is actually representing a very similar kind of cohort of uh, micro and small businesses. When somebody hears the name eBay, they might think of this giant internet company, um, which is sort of true, but it's actually built uh, and established by a, a large amount of small businesses, micro enterprises, also sometimes one and two people, oftentimes one and two people all around the world. Um, and it's really a network and a platform for those folks to be able to access customers and, and trade in their products. And then on the PayPal side, uh, you have it used for basically anything that goes on over the internet. If you're a blogger and you want to take donations for your blog, uh, your blog may be read by people all over the world and donations may come in from people all over the world. Um, if you sell digital goods or you're an app manufacturer, you need some way to accept payments and these apps are bought all around the world and PayPal serves as a method for you to accept payments from anybody anywhere. So the, the trend I'm going to talk about uh, is interesting, I think, for IGF, because IGF, uh, from what I understand, this is my first time here, um, is focused largely on the internet infrastructure aspects of, uh, of the internet. And uh, eBay, PayPal, these are applications built on top of that infrastructure. And the people using them are even further from the, the kind of infrastructure discussions. But I think it's really important to understand the benefits um, that everyday individual entrepreneurs, businesses are experiencing as a result of the power of the internet. And I think that helps to um, kind of give some context to the, a lot of the debates that happen here around, um, you know, privacy or data protection or some of the, you know, infrastructure issues. Um, I think understanding what's happening on the lower levels of the stack really helps to frame that. So. Uh, that's, that's really what I'm going to talk about is how the, the open internet, the internet infrastructure, the global internet is enabling anyone anywhere to engage in global trade. And this is a very new and exciting trend. Um, so here's a picture of the global internet and uh, it moving over the course of a day. This was actually made by a hacker who, <laughs> who hacked into, uh, I believe, 400,000 computers all around the world and, uh, you know, uh, lit, basically created this graphic that lights up and shows where activity, where computers are logging onto the internet. Um, so that just gives some context to how global the internet is, which is something you all know. Um, but I really want to talk about how the internet is changing commerce because that's what our company does and what I, what I work on. Um, and I think it's a, a very unique um, change that's really never before been possible and never happened. And Freed, Freed really talked about it on a local level where you have 
these individual uh, small businesses that are accessing their local customers and learning about their local customers in very new and exciting ways and using data to enhance their processes, what's happening over eBay is really cross-border transactions. So a person living in New Zealand, for example, accessing a customer in Mexico, and there's the, the platform of eBay creates the trust for the retail purposes, and the platform of PayPal or credit card creates the trust for the transaction purposes. And so traditionally, again, um, the way in which a small business, like the woman represented here, would link into the kind of global commerce, global globalization, global commerce has existed for a long time, for many years, but the traditional model by which she would do that is she would somehow create a product or manufacture a product, an intermediary product, that would link into a giant corporation's you know, network. So maybe she made she manufactured some kind of shirt that was sold at Walmart, for example. And that would be the way that a small business would really experience the benefits of globalization. And that's how they would access consumers, because if you're small and local, it's very difficult for you to be found in an offline context. And now, uh, just to reiterate that uh, in a more you know, robust fashion, you, you would have a very kind of standardized supply chain that got created, where the manufacturer is in one country, the distributor is in another country, you have an export handler who helps you, you go through a container ship, and, and on and on and on. It's a very traditional model for trade, where the manufacturer you know, makes some intermediary product, and it goes through this chain uh, with several players in between to eventually get to consumer. And what we are seeing uh, in the internet age um, is a, a vastly uh, more efficient model, I think. Um, where a lot of the traditional players have been kind of disaggregated, disintermediated, I guess is the term. So you have a, a manufacturer, an internet retailer, so the, the same person who manufactures a shirt, let's, let's take as an, an example, um, is able to go on the internet, create a website for their shirt, and be able to access customers in other countries or in their locality. And then they simply utilize either an intermediary marketer to get their name out there more or a shipping company to actually ship the physical product. And that's really the only connection between them and the consumer. Otherwise, it's a very, very direct connection, whereas in the classical model, you had you know, nine steps between that initial manufacturer and the consumer. So this is a, it's, it's, it's not to say that this model will completely kind of take over the old model. There, will, there are efficiencies to having uh, you know, a large supply chain. But there is this parallel new model that's particularly being used by small businesses that's, that's very exciting um, and very new. And it's also sustainable. So we're, we're talking about sustainable development, I think, a lot here at IGF. And the interesting part of this new model is that it is quite sustainable. So let's say, for example, you have a manufacturer who is, again, also has a website and creates a, a retail website in Turkey, for example. He uses an intermediary marketer or a shipper in Thailand and accesses a consumer in Japan. That consumer buys the, I keep using the example of shirt, but let's say, uh, let's say book, let's say computer, let's say laptop computer, buys the laptop computer, oh yeah, book was a good example, uh, buys the laptop computer in Japan and uses it for a while, decides, eh, I don't really like this laptop, and will utilize an intermediary marketer, marketer and shipper in Nigeria, and it's bought by a, a consumer in Cote d'Ivoire, and then that consumer in Cote d'Ivoire uses the, iPad, the laptop for a little while, decides, ah, I don't really want this one anymore, uses an intermediary marketer in Colombia, and ships to a consumer in Brazil. This model is actually possible right now. There are intermediary marketers and shippers in all of these countries I've mentioned, and they would enable these, uh, these businesses to access customers in these markets. So this is not a kind of, a, you know, uh, yeah, hypothetical. This is, this is real. This, this happens um, in the modern Internet economy. And we call this trend the global empowerment network. That's kind of the, the term we have used to capture it. And again, it's, it's kind of a, a new model, a model where anybody, anywhere, any size business can engage in the global, global market. And what is needed for that is really four things. Uh, you need the internet, obviously, which is all we've been talking about. Um, you also need some of the services that you know, are, part of the, are a part of the system, so whether it's marketing, uh, financial services, uh, and then you know, uh, part, 
of ICANN, obviously. So you need some of the services that are built on top of the internet. Uh, and then you need logistics. If you have a physical product, you need some way to actually get your physical product to your, con to your consumer. And then all of this, and this is why we're all here, I guess, is kind of laced with policy. And you need to get the policy aspects right if you want this uh, global empowerment network to exist. Um, but again, I mentioned that this is not a, uh, a hypothetical. This is reality. And on the eBay network, uh, we have over 100 million uh, users all around the world. And uh, over 60% of our Really small businesses. So we, we looked at only those sellers that were selling $10,000 or more in a year. So that's not that much money to be selling over the eBay platform. But they might have their own website, they might use Amazon, they might use different methods to access a customer. So we said $10,000, that's a pretty small business. Let's look at these guys. And we looked at them in Peru, just as a kind of uh, an exemplar of a developing country, uh, to see what are the trends with these types of sellers. $10,000 or more, you're living in Peru, you're utilizing the eBay market plat the marketplace platform to sell your physical products. What happens? What we found was pretty interesting. 100% of those businesses export to different markets, all of them. Every single seller we looked at had used the platform to export. Whereas in the traditional offline context, the, the figures that Peru publishes as a country, uh, only 14% of their businesses export. So just that sheerly in itself demonstrates the power of the internet. That you can instantly connect to a consumer outside of your, your you know, locality and export to them and establish trust. They reach 25 destinations on average. That's on average. That's not all of them put together. That's on average, they reach 25 different destinations. In the offline context, it was three. Uh, market share of newcomers is a very interesting figure because if you think about exporters or trade in the classical sense, it's done by traditional sense in Peru, newcomers only were able to capture 2% of the exporting market, a very small share. But on eBay, newcomers are 20% of the market. Uh, the survival rate is much higher on, on the internet than it is in the offline context. And then this, is, this last point is, again, uh, very similar to the newcomer's argument, where it says the concentration of sales to the largest 5% in, uh, in, in traditional Peruvian trade is 91%. So the largest 5% of the exporters have 91% of the sales. Whereas on eBay, the largest 5% of the exporters only have 16% of the shares. So it's very, very flat in terms of you know, who can access the market and who can benefit from it. So the same thing held true when we looked at Indonesia. We're in Indonesia, so I thought I'd show the slide. Very, very similar types of findings. You know, similar rate of exporting. All of them export. They all reach, you know, 30-plus countries. We didn't have offline data to compare it to, but I imagine the offline data is similar to Peru. Similar type of market share for newcomers, similar survival rate, and similar concentration of sales. So very, very high numbers when compared with offline trade, just to demonstrate how significant the boost is from the Internet. And uh, oh, that second thing wasn't supposed to show up, but uh, the, the chart on your left uh, is, I think, one of the most fascinating charts ever, but it's kind of uh, wonky and, and a little bit dense. So I'll try to just simplify it a great deal. We did studies looking at Peru, Indonesia, Ukraine, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, Chile, um, South Africa, Jordan, a number of developing countries. And then we did studies looking at the US, the UK, France, Germany, developed countries. The, the largest developed countries. And the findings from those studies were exactly the same. So uh, to describe that a little bit, if you look at traditional exporting between developed countries and developing countries, the, the figures are vastly different. You know, developing countries are just getting into the global nature of trade, and developed countries dominate it. But if you look at the internet platforms, it's really a flat marketplace. It's really the idea that the opportunity exists exactly the same 
for that business in Peru as it does for that business in Germany. And there's the figures to prove it. The share of exporting is exactly the same. They reach the same amount of export destinations. They survive at a very similar rate. The concentration of sales between the biggest players and the smallest players is very similar. We, weren't, we didn't do this on purpose. We did all of these studies completely separately. And when we created this chart, we were surprised that it was this flat, that there was this much of a similarity of opportunity between you know, some of our really, really big sellers in the UK and Germany who have 70 plus employees and some of our really, really small sellers in Chile who have no employees. Very, very similar statistics. And that demonstrates really, I think, for the first time how flat the internet can make the marketplace, can really connect consumers and merchants in a way that was never before possible. And this thing that came up is just a case study, an exemplar. You know, Kana Jewels, a husband and wife team in India, had a local jewelry shop sold to the people who walked by their store for a few years, for several years. Went online, I believe, in 2002. They have, they're now employing 30 plus people. And they're selling all around the world, they say Asia, North America, Europe. I mean, this is the opportunity. This is the real stories that are happening. And uh, on the eBay marketplace alone, we have 500,000 of these types of merchants, folks selling over $10,000 or more on the platform. So it's not any small trend either. It's, it's a pretty large one. And again, that's just the eBay marketplace. There's other marketplaces that exist. There's people using services. There's people using their own websites. So this is, this is really big, and it's happening. And the last... Part of my presentation will just be on the policy side because I said the policy is what tinges all of this um, and, and, and uh, hinges all of this, I should say. It, 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 if the policy is right, this stuff will only continue to grow and the opportunity will only continue to uh, be enhanced. So uh, the big session tomorrow, it sounds like, is going to be on development. And I think this, exemp this example, both from Grameen Foundation and, and from our side, changes the debate about development um, and what is traditionally me meant between the developed world and the developing world and the kind of infighting, the classical battles that have happened. And I just love all these examples, so I'm just going to keep using them. This is ThaiCraftWarehouse.com, not an eBay merchant necessarily. I, I think they sell separately on eBay, but they, they have their own website. And they sell all sorts of locally manufactured Thai products. Uh, they have a Facebook page uh, with, I think, like, 5,000 likes or something, 140 likes. Um, and this is, this is just data from, uh, I think it's ITU, but it, it describes uh, the growth of Internet users around the world. So the, the point of this slide is that small business in Thailand that used to be the subject of the development debate was how to get that small business to grow. Um, because they're located in Thailand, and they, how do they get access to capital? How do they get consumers? How do they grow? That is being changed fundamentally by the Internet and by what the Internet offers. You know, the, the ability to connect socially through Facebook platforms, the ability to market your product, the ability to accept payments for your product, all of that fundamentally changed by the Internet. Um, <laughs> You know, I think everybody here talks about broadband and, and smartphone proliferation, so I'm not going to harp on that. But just to say, you know, mobile phones are an amazing technology, and what they've done to empower um, to empower uh, folks all around the world. But the smartphone is really the, the the step where they can take it beyond just their locality. Using a smartphone really plugs you into that global network. Um, and as I mentioned, the mobile phone helps you do a lot of things now locally. You can do your financial banking, you can do some payments in certain countries, but if you want to access the global marketplace, the smartphone is really what enables that. Um, one other concept that's really, really significant and I don't think gets talked about enough is the idea that the Internet is a stack and there are you know, parts of the, of the stack that are built on top of one another. And at the lowest levels and throughout, the ideas of openness and non-discrimination are absolutely essential. The idea that applications living on top of these telecommunications layers are accessible to anybody is incredibly important um, and central to the uh, idea of this, of this network continuing to grow. Uh, intellectual property policy, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the idea of balancing 
the enforcement of intellectual property rights uh, with the limitations and exceptions that enable some of these smaller players in particular to reference brands, to be able to offer uh, major brands as products uh, is essential. So you need to get intellectual property policy right on a global scale because, again, all these transactions are happening cross-border. Um, and lastly is the, is the concept that uh, I was encouraged to talk about by a longtime IGF veteran. Uh, her name is Laura Denardis. She's an internet law scholar in America. And I was on a round table with her recently. And she talked about how at the Internet Governance Forum, we often don't talk about issues that are outside of the internet, <laughs> kind of the, the traditional you know, internet issues. And uh, a lot of what I've been talking about is outside of that. But I really want to throw out a few things that I don't think anybody at the Internet Governance Forum talks about. Um, and that's really, really offline issues. Uh, a lot of the small businesses that are <laughs> that are engaging in this type of new internet trade are dealing with very unique customs problems because there's never been small businesses like this that have sold across borders. And so when a when the internet when you when you when you when you reach that customer over your own website, uh, you know, it, it, for example, you're in New Zealand, you access the customer in Peru. There's no customs that has anything to do with that. There's, you can just free flow. There's free flow of information. You can access the information. But if you want to send the product over to them, you're going to run into some serious problems because the models uh, that were created around customs were not made for this new type of trade. Um, shipping also kind of was created for a certain type of shipment, these large... I always have this graphic that I didn't put on this where it's like a large ship versus a smartphone. A large ship is classical trade, a smartphone is modern trade. And when you think about shipping individual items, the, the system just wasn't designed for that. Um, and lastly, consumer protection laws, which are incredibly important, and particularly to internet companies that want to maintain a, a, a strong consumer base and want to make sure that their consumers are protected. But having to deal with 100 plus different regimes all around the world is incredibly difficult, not for eBay, for the small business that's on the platform and reaching the customer. They're the ones that are going to be responsible to all these different authorities. Like I showed you on this other slide, you've got some small business in Indonesia that's reaching 36 markets, right? They don't know the laws of the, of, of, the, of the 36 markets they're reaching. And so the idea that they can meet all of the consumer protection requirements, the different consumer protection requirements, is unlikely. And so harmonizing those and working... Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I, I somehow have a feeling that we'll get a few more comments from, uh, from you, given <laughs> that you're actually doing a number of things that, that, are, that are said. Um, are there any comments, questions, observations? Uh, Brecken from Rabbit, also in New Zealand. Um, I've actually been looking into payment stuff recently on some of the stuff New Zealand is adding. Uh, we've got a joint venture going between the banks and the telecoms to do with mobile payments and enabling that over the next couple of years. Um, but we've also been looking at the international case, and for us that's coming down to very strongly the, the trust thing that Don mentioned earlier, um, which is that in a number of countries that we might want to trade with, uh, there are significant problems with credit card fraud and that kind of thing. Um, and payments are generally on a pretty horrible basis for merchants in those environments in the sense of you kind of have 180 days exposure to people and chargebacks. Um, it would be interesting to know if you have any thoughts about what can be done about that because it's often far too large an exposure for small businesses. Agreed. So uh, I think there's, I think what I talked about in the customs and shipping context is equally applicable to the payments context. You've got regulatory regimes that were set up for local banking and had no concept that people would be sending money across, you know, an entire globe instantly in very small amounts. And so I'm, this is a bit of a cop-out, but the first 
step is education to these to the payments to the central banks particularly but also the payments regulators in a lot of these countries to say this is incredibly beneficial and i think the one argument to make uh, for them that will be interesting, and it's a bit controversial, is to talk about remittances. Um, very, very high rates uh, on remittances to a lot of these countries. Um, but they want, those, they want that capital inflowing to their customers. They're less, they're less happy about their customers buying stuff from overseas um, and using payments for that purpose. But I think discussing the argument with a lot of these government officials from the idea that you've got this, these powerful um, communities of immigrants in other countries and they want to send money back, but they have to deal with these horrible regulations that are equally applicable um, and that, that cause tremendous amounts of problems for inflows of capital. So if you reduce your, the regulatory burdens on inflows of capital, and this, you, you want to get it so it's the same for exflows, um, then you really can, can, can um, add a lot to your consumer economy. So I think that might be my one kind of argument to be making with these regulators, is educating them about kind of the, the benefits that could come from increased remittances. I think it's something like 9.5% gets cut from every remittance that's going into a lot of these developing world countries. <laughs> Obscenely expensive. That's another one. <laughs> up to twenty. Up to twenty. An average of like nine point five or something. I've read. So nice business model for the middleman. Uh, yeah. Right. It was interesting on on that point. I would um, to the lady. I would I would observe that there was a study done on on cross border buying in the EU a couple of years ago, and the European Union actually found that even within the, the common market, there was a considerable percentage of Europeans who were uncomfortable buying products from a firm outside of their own country because they were uncertain what the consumer protection regime in other EU member states would be and whether they would be protected in case they got something other than as described and the like. And that's within a common market. Um, so it, it, it's really true. Not only uh, not only can a, a merchant not really understand what may or may not be his or her obligations, but how is a customer to know how their national consumer protection laws interact with the laws that relate to the seller in the country of origin? It's not part, you know it's not feasible with 190 countries. But please. Um, thanks. Um, going back to, to what you were mentioning about the odd geography of online commerce, it's, it's an equal problem in the opposite direction. As, as a consumer who works in Africa a lot and sometimes gets robbed and needs to reorder all of my electronics out of Africa, <laughs> I go online to Amazon and instantly my account gets shut down because I'm in West Africa. Instantly. It happens like many times in a row and Amazon don't tell me for a week. So I continue trying to use the account. And I've tried that with every single online vendor that I would normally use from London. And all of them instantly believe that I am some kind of fraudster. And, it's, and I'm imagining, you know, well, not imagining, all of my friends in Ghana can't get books delivered, can't get any, you know, can't get a computer delivered, nothing. So, so there's, there's the same problem with goods coming into these countries, which, which you've absolutely touched on, but, but I was wondering if you could speak again about so, you know, what we do to combat that. Uh, simple first step trade facilitation agreement at the WTO would be very, very helpful. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, am I allowed to defend Amazon? I think I am. Um, one of the reasons, <laughs> no, I'm joking. One of the reasons I think that they have difficulty, right, is, uh, some of the regulations that you have to deal with in, in those countries aren't even readily available. So you don't know what you'd potentially be dealing with if you allowed a consumer from that country to, to purchase a product over your network. So that's a first step, uh, is for the intermediaries to be able to understand what they're dealing with. So I think that's one step, and I would offer that as a defense for the intermediaries. Um, the second step is the, uh, something I mentioned earlier. This is all quite new. Um, and gradually, gradually growing. And so the, the ability to be able to pull off these cross-border transactions as an intermediary in any kind of broad fashion requires a large amount of data about the particular 
uh, consumer base and, and, and area. And so it's just such a new phenomenon in Africa in particular. I actually was on a panel once with a gentleman from Nigeria, and he was very upset about PayPal's practices in Nigeria and, and our, our, you know, the, the ability to be able to, to buy products from Nigeria using PayPal. And my response was, the difficulty is the Internet makes you global instantly. And so you and we want to be global and we want to serve everybody, but there has been, you know, examples of frauds in in those countries. And without an adequate amount of data and without an adequate consumer base in those those countries, it makes it very difficult to be able to provide the service. Um, so I I just think that you know one of the issues that's discussed here a lot, connectivity, access, as that grows, as more and more people log into the network, you have more and more data and more and more ability to be able to offer strong services in those countries. Again, not, not a great answer, but I, I think that's part of it. Well, I, I don't have on this one, but I just want to add up the part about the mobile money um, challenges in several countries, especially Indonesia. Uh, one of the many countries thinking is who actually run the mobile money? Telco or banks? You know, um, <coughs> In Kenya, it's successful because there's only one telco, um, you know, own banks also. In Indonesia, we have 11 telco companies, and then we have thousands of banks. Um, <clears throat> uh, so Bank of Indonesia also want to protect uh, against the money laundry using, you know, mobile money. Uh, so that's, that's why it is very difficult for, for um, people to... to engage in mobile money business at this moment because there's some uncertainty on regulation. It was mentioned that, you know, regulatory is important. Uh, especially when Bank of Indonesia decided to use the bank-led model, meaning the mobile money, micro microtransfer, those kind of things will be bank basis, not telco basis. So if the bank, bank is very heavily regulated, uh, bank requires KYC, know your customers. I mean, the other part uh, of the receiving uh, end should be known who are they. That's the thing. So that's the uh, challenge in, in uh, you know, micropayment, uh, transfer, and those kind of thing. Please. It's uh, Richard Woody from, also from New Zealand. Um, a lot of Kiwis in here today, I see. I recently saw a presentation on Bitcoin, and I wonder whether that sort of... Um, currency that's independent of governments and and telcos and banks is perhaps something that could be useful in these in these situations. Bitcoin, I'm not really familiar with that. You I was telling Nick earlier, in my personal capacity I've been doing more research on Bitcoin and I think it's fascinating. So I'll answer from my personal capacity. Uh, and there that's one of Bitcoin's promoters' strongest uh, points about why Bitcoin is a, is, is a potential development tool is that it would greatly reduce the cost of remittances. So you wouldn't be subject to kind of the, the high fees that are associated with central banks if you were able to transfer remittances over Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, it, it could be. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other factors to Bitcoin um, related to, you know, how they're regulated and how they're monitored and all those kind of things. But I think that's one of their main arguments is that, um, you know, if if the, this kind of decentralized system is used for transfers of, of uh, currency, whatever you want to call it, money, um, then you would have, it would be a, a way around a lot of the issues that, that kind of play cross-border remittances right now. It's interesting. I'll tell you an interesting anecdote Well, we wait for hands to raise. Um, I was speaking to the, um, the WTO ambassador of a, a um, Southeast Asian country, I'll leave it at that, um, who was saying to me that um, the trade ministry had actually intervened in, uh, in a discussion about national laws in, in inside the country on a practical matter because it had been proposed that 
um, all mobile payment systems, all e-money e e systems, should be obliged to have anyone who signs up for an account in that country show up with an ID at an office in order to validate because that's what banks do. And the trade ministry said, well, wait a minute, but that, that's not really the model we're looking for, for for mobile money because in many countries that's not practical. Even in our own country we have people who are, you know, quite poor and they, they just don't have IDs and addresses and, and all of this. You have to allow for, for more flexibility. Um, and I thought that was an, an interesting, uh, I was quite pleased to hear that in a way because it's not normally the case that a trade ministry which is concerned with external trade would actually say, well, but wait a minute. <laughs> if, if we all did that, then we wouldn't actually be able to use e-money in most regions of the world or for many uh, of the people who would most benefit from micropayments. Um, can I, I can add a little bit before we go to the next question. The regulation now allow, I think, it up to a million that you don't have to identify yourself, know your customer. So if you remember, you buy this um, flashcard, BCA flashcard, BRI. Uh, there's some, um, you can buy it without even register who you are but only limit certain things, amount. But um, to use mobile, and the mo biggest challenge is the agent of that in the villages, because that they were the one who handling money, that would be difficult uh, for a bank to, to just let go, uh, telco can do it. So that's one, one of the reasons, um, you know, mobile money is still under, currently under the pilot project, banks of Indonesia are learning. Um, I think at the end of the, the task force of the regulation has been two, three years. The pilot started in June, supposed to be finished in the, um, December. From there, they probably know how to engage the last mile agent um, because the key element is that in the mobile money, you should convenience find a way you can get the cash out of your system or pay that. That's, that's most essential on the mobile money. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Helmi. I'm from Denpasar here. Uh, well, I'm uh, as a lecturer in campus, and the campus name is Primakara. Uh, just two months ago, we have meeting, and we decided that uh, one of the vision of the campus is to be a technopreneur campus. So technopreneur, we mean that the student will be guided to be entrepreneur in the technology area, so we call as technopreneur. And one of our uh, problem is the limitation of resources in campus. You know, mostly lecturer, as me also, uh, dominated in theory, but like in practical. So what I want to know is whether eBay or Grayman have a special program for students, so so that we can do a kind of cooperation or something for our students. Thank you. Now I know why you invite me, uh, Nick. <laughs> uh, my, in my past life, I was working with one uh, USA project uh, called uh, developing, uh, helping a small and medium enterprises. Uh, in three years of my tour, tour of duty there, I started a, comp uh, a competition, business business competition with uh, Microsoft, it's called Imulai. So Imulai actually, um, exactly what you are looking for, you know, having idea and then giving them um, $25,000 seed capital. And during that period, it's uh, evol evolved from just simple uh, com uh, business plan competition into the last one that I have, uh, Imulai five, uh, 4, where we actually bringing the venture capital from all, all over the world to Indonesia, and the finalists have to present it. Uh, good thing is that, I think I heard story, there were out of 10, uh, three still uh, going strong. Um, and then I changed job now. I work for Grameen. So to answer your question, um, yes, there's, a comp there's an institution called GAPI. I think you heard, Global Ent Enterprise Indonesia, they facilitate that. Um, Makar. Uh, from uh, Sampurna Foundation. Now, but that is in the early stage. You have idea, you know, you get, you win business competition and stuff. 
Grameen entering when you all when you investment ready. Number one. Number two, you have to work for the benefit of the poor. So if you solution creating games, for example, is not going to fit in our things. But if you create a solution, not necessarily technology, but simple technology, for example, lamp, water filter, uh, you know, solar panel, those kind of things, we, yes, we can. The only thing is that you have to be investment ready, so you already passed certain stage. So that's my answer. <coughs> No improvement available. Another question? So I, I have some, uh, some questions, but I'll just make some, some comments. Uh, in terms of consumer protection, um, from our perspective, we operate in New Zealand, and, uh, but it is a challenge for the consumers. And, and what we do to protect ourselves in terms of payment so that we don't have this 180 days later we get a call from the bank, by the way, that credit card uh, transaction balance, is we use trusted intermediaries. So we use Amazon and A-Books and Biblio and, and so forth. And eBay would be, a, I think, a trusted intermediary. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but looking at the, your last slide with the, with the issues, uh, I would put uh, uh, sh shipping rules and shipping costs because they are disproportionate. Somebody from the UK can send a book to New Zealand for half of what it would cost me to send the same book to the UK. Uh, and the other point that while we serve uh, international markets, that's about 40% of our our business is exported books. We also do a lot of business to rural New Zealand where there aren't a lot of uh, bookshops. So you can service New Zealand, a developed country, uh, but people out in the middle of nowhere still may want what you want to buy. And I, my other question in terms of PayPal, are there countries that you don't work in We're, we're available to users, which is kind of a, a broad term, uh, meaning you can sign up for a PayPal account as a consumer side uh, in 190 markets. Uh, but from a merchant side, it's a little bit, I, I don't know the exact number, but I, I believe there are certain markets where it's more where we don't offer the service right now. So Nigeria, perhaps? or Nigeria, Nigeria would be an example. <laughs> um, yes. And... Is there any way for me to put money into somebody else's bank account if I have their banking details? Uh, yes, there's a uh, there's um, called it's called the send money feature on PayPal, yep. uh, where you can directly send something to someone else's bank account, um, and it utilizes a tech, uh, a service uh, we'll call it called International IAT, uh, which stands for International. Uh, ACH transaction, and ACH stands for Automated Crediting House, um, but it's the idea of, uh, you know, these, bank, uh, these banks have set numbers and they, yep. they transmit information. So, yes, you can. Okay. I could have used that the other day. Thank you. <laughs> I believe we have some, a question from a uh, remote participant. Okay, it's a long question. This is from Matthias. <laughs> One of the issues that I have heard people worry about when buying from sellers abroad is that they don't get the import tax back when they return a product. Um, it seems to be an important disadvantage of international online trade and one that also has a technological dimension to it because even if you have the right to reclaim the import tax from your local authority, I imagine the administrative burden to do so is quite substantial in many countries. Have you applied any sort of moonshot thinking on this problem? It seems that we'd almost need to have a global customs equivalent to the global marketplace that platforms like eBay provide in order to really establish a level playing field for the small sellers engaged in exporting. Can I just say I've been a victim of that in Switzerland 
myself because Switzerland does not refund duty and VAT even if they, the goods are, are returned. So uh, Switzerland, actually, the example I'm going to use is from the U.S. This is actually a quite a problem in the developed world, let alone in the developing world. Um, in the U.S., uh, if a small business shipped a product to a consumer in Switzerland, let's say, for example, and then this consumer in Switzerland didn't like it, sent it back, to get your customs duty back uh, as a merchant in the U.S., you have to fill out a five-page form that's in paper. You can print it in PDF. Uh, you print it, fill it out. It has a 32-page instruction manual that comes along with it. And then you have to mail it uh, to the Customs Bureau and pray that you get some money back. Uh, it was, it's called a duty drawback form. Um, and uh, we lobbied quite hard on that because it's just simply absurd. But it was designed, the, the thing, it was designed for a different world. It was designed for a world where some giant manufacturer was getting a product back from their intermediary, you know, a warehouse or whatever. And so, to its credit, Congress has found this is a problem and has uh, included, no, they've included a fix that would reduce the paperwork and el basically eliminate the paperwork and let you apply for these kind of duty drawbacks in a much more simple fashion um, in a bill that's hopefully going to get passed in the next year or so. Um, so. So people are recognizing this is a problem. Uh, and it, it, the solution that we offered, actually, was even beyond just the concept of, uh, of kind of reducing the paperwork. It was actually creating what this gentleman seemed to be hinting at, an online system where you can plug in your details about the item, uh, you know, online, <laughs> just go on the computer, say what the, you know, you, you should be able to do your customs forms online, submit them online, and then if you need to do duty drawback, you can just do it in a couple of clicks. We've discussed with them the concept of APIs and being able to plug in your information, and they, they get it. They're just quite antiquated in their technology and in their way of thinking about what trade is. And so as I've continued to say, this is a very new Phenomenon. It's exciting because we're at the at the precipice. I think of a very exciting trend where people all around the world will be engaging in in global commerce, and that's I think a net positive and a great thing. Um, but some of these these kind of classical customs regulatory issues are going to need some fresh thinking and some some new ideas and some technological ideas. Uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, I I work uh, as Usman knows. I work about half my time on trade policy. And um, it's interesting, it, you know, we're used to ITU and other UN agencies where the, the, the starting place of a discussion is, surely we must regulate something by the end of this conversation. We must do something. We must pre prepare rules. And, of course, the WTO is starting from what can we get rid of today? You know, what rules can we, how can we get out of the way of something? Um, and so it, it's, <laughs> it's a refreshing thing because you go through there and you say something like this and they go, but that's a non-tariff barrier. We should get rid of that. Uh, that's the default response. And so you, you all, at the beginning, you have to go, wait a minute, did I just hear that? I didn't even have to fight for that, and they, they agreed with me. So uh, it's ironic. This is one of the things that, that isn't really appreciated about free trade and the WTO, which has a, a bad reputation in, in parts of civil society. But ironically enough, um, uh, when it comes to the Internet and commerce, it's, it's actually a pretty friendly place in that regard. I just want to add one thing quickly to that, to that discussion point. Free trade and the WTO and these uh, entities have also had classical fights, just like ex that exist at IGF or other places that are, are more regulatory maybe in fashion. And that was about the idea that it was developed world uh, countries were going to get all these regulations removed, and that was going to let them flood the market of developing world countries and, and take over. And part of the presentation that I gave is to say, when you're talking about the internet and these small guys, the idea that somebody in Peru can benefit just as much from reducing the regulation as somebody in the Germany is a fundamental game changer when it comes to this debate. And I think that's something to keep in mind, as many of you will probably be in discussions around these topics, is that's the game changer of the Internet, is that it, it changes this debate about developing world versus developed world. Um, and, and hopefully that, that will really smooth some of the classical battles that have been going on in the trade space, to say, if we remove this 
non-tariff barrier or regulatory issue, we are going to be helping businesses in the developing world exactly the same as we're going to be helping businesses in the developed world. And that's, that's the really exciting part of the story. Well, I, I, I see we have seven minutes left. Um, is there a, um, a burning issue, burning question? Nothing online? Well, I guess we can wrap up. Uh, Free, do you have any final thoughts you want to offer? Well, I, actually, I'm not so much of a uh, can offer in, in the sense of a global. But I think um, what what I what Grameen interested now actually to find small medium enterprises that could help the poor and you know uh, create jobs, create incomes. So, if any of you think that there's a way for you to participate on that mission, please contact me. Amen. And a UN meeting in which real people actually get helped. I don't, I don't see that many of those. Um, anything, Usman? Uh, no? Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, for you, thanks to you all for coming. Thanks for the, uh, the, the questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, learned something. I learned something in pretty much every session I attend. Um, I hope you did too. Thanks for coming.